What's up, everybody? Happy Friday. I'm David Wilson, and I'm back again for another Emacs from Scratch live stream. So uh, last time we went through how to set up a projectile and maggot, or maggot, if you like to call it that, uh, to uh, manage your project workflow. And uh, in this episode, we're going to move on to a different package in Emacs. Uh, it probably is one that you've heard mentioned a lot whenever people talk about like the reasons why they switched to Emacs or like the best packages of Emacs. And that package is called org mode. So org mode is a, uh, it basically, let, let's start at the top. It's like an outliner. So you could basically say this is a, a package for writing documents that, are, that have outlines. So you have like different headers with subheaders, etc. But org mode takes it way, way further than that. So aside from just being a regular outliner and markup language, uh, it also does things like allowing you to manage to-dos, uh, do project management, um, execute code and see the output of the code inside of a document, um, uh, like write out files on your on your system. I mean, it allows you to do a, a lot of things. So uh, today we're going to start with the basics. We're going to go through like how to use org mode at a basic level, what the features are. And then uh, in future streams, we're gonna get into more of the details about how to do like project planning, task planning, and uh, some of the other fancy things you can do with it. Um, so let's go ahead and just jump right into the configuration. So um, as I uh, mention every time, please feel free at any time to um, um, raise questions in the chat. If you're here today, just say, uh, hey, say good morning. Um, I'm happy to have everyone here this morning. And uh, another thing I want to call out is that I have renamed the repo. So it was called RuneMax before, but I figured, you know, that's kind of a vague name. So I went ahead and changed the repo name to Emacs from scratch, as you can see here. So uh, all the links that have been going to that repo so far will still work because GitHub redirects the links. So don't worry about that part. But um, just to know that uh, this is where the, the home of the configuration is for now. So let's check it out. Let me go ahead and get our uh, Emacs running again. And uh, let's see, run Emacs. Let's see if everything loads up this time. So as you notice, there are some things happening in the background right now. Basically, whenever you start it up, it, uh, it searches to make sure that all packages are uh, pulled down. I must have removed some the last time. So uh, it's just pulling things down once more. It's pulling down everything. I must have deleted the folder. Oh, you know what? I actually have hard-coded the path to where I'm storing the packages, which is a mistake on my part, so that explains why this is happening. But that's not a problem for right now. We'll just go ahead with that. Still working. Okay, now I think it's getting close to done. So uh, this is another good example of the startup experience whenever you clone your uh, configuration repo for the first time and run Emacs when you use use package because it will start downloading all the packages you have set up and you'll get like this, you'll usually get this uh, window that pops up that tells you about all the warnings, etc. And uh, oh great, now it has to compile the Emacs SQL binary one more time. So I apologize for the delay on that, but uh, this is just sort of what, what happens whenever you start changing things around while you're trying to stream. give that one more time. So um, while that's going on, how about I just jump over to the org mode homepage, just org mode.org. And um, at this site, you can get some high level information about what org mode is. Basically, they say that it's for keeping notes, maintaining to do lists, planning projects, authoring documents, blah, blah, blah. Um, it does a lot more than that. And you can figure out all the things that it can do by going to the manual. So if you go to the manual page, and there's a lot of information here about what org mode is capable of. And I highly recommend that you go scan through this if you've never used org mode before, because you might uh, see a few things that catch your eye and uh, sort of encourage you to want to try it out. So now our uh, Emacs is finally woken up. So let's go ahead and just jump down to the bottom and continue on with our configuration by typing use package org. Uh, org may already be installed, but let's see. Um, oh, I should also mention uh, to make sure that you are using the latest version of org mode, you should add the org entry to your package archives. Um, it, it points directly to the, the ELPA installation at orgmode.org. Uh, you want to do this because um, Emacs does come with org mode, but typically the one that it comes with is pretty out of date compared to the one that has been released uh, on the main repository. And we can actually check that out by looking at the org version variable. 
Um, so it says 9.4 here. I think what must have happened is that another package pulled in org mode for some reason, but um, I think that's the latest version. So we won't have to install it this time. So I'll just run that. Probably won't do anything because org's already installed. And what we'll do is just create a basic org mode document so we can show some of the functionality that org mode provides just in a sort of document form. So I will create a file called hello.org. And uh, let me kill my uh, panel. All right, so now you can see what's happening at the top of the screen. So in org mode, um, the general, hi, Jerry, nice to see you. Uh, the, the, the sort of basic syntax for making an outline in org mode is to use a, a star at the beginning of a line. So if you just type one star and then you type something like uh, first heading, then you will see, and I apologize, this font is a little bit small. Let's see if I can actually scale that up. Text scale, uh, adjust. Okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, so we have our first heading and uh, you can continue adding headings like that. So if I wanted to go add a second heading and then, um, hi Vanit, and uh, you can add content inside. So here is some content, uh, second heading. And uh, you can see that Emacs and org mode are already coloring these lines because they know that this is a header or a heading because of the, the one star. If you wanted to add a, a star below that or a, a heading, like a subheading, let's say, you could have two stars and then say subheading. And then you get a different color and uh, you can see that that's basically indicates that it is a different heading. So um, since I said that org mode is an outliner, now I'll show you what that actually means. So you have this document that has some basic content uh, let's just add some more content. And um, what you can do is uh, hit the shift tab key, and this collapses the outline that you have in the file so that you can see just the top level headings. And uh, the shift tab key actually cycles through different visibility modes for all the headings that you have in your file. So if I hit shift tab again, it goes into the basically the outline mode where you can see all of the headings that are in the file, but none of the content. So the first level just gives you all the top level headings and the second level of uh, visibility gives you all of the headings themselves. So you can get it like a, like a bird's eye view of what's in the document. Then if you hit shift tab one more time, in fact, I remember now I should turn on the global uh, command mode. Okay, now you'll be able to see what I'm doing. If I hit shift tab one more time, oh, one more time, then you see that the content shows up again. So um, this is sort of the, the, the basic of what it means to, to be editing an outline in org mode. And you'll probably be using this a lot if you are using org mode a lot because uh, you may have a file that has um, like a both to-do list and notes. So whenever I do work, um, I often have a file that has like sort of my list of things I wanna do, but also like copious notes about what I've been investigating, whatever, if I'm looking for like a bug or if I'm uh, developing a feature or something. And uh, sometimes you just want to see like what those uh, those main headings are and not all of the other stuff that's inside the file. So using shift tab is really helpful for that. So um, that tells you a little bit about just the general outline. But there's other things you can do in org mode, like um, you can do basic formatting of text. So if I were to add stars around some, uh, it makes it bold. So uh, you can do more or less rich text editing with org mode. Um, and then whenever you export org mode content to a file, like let's say an HTML page, that con that uh, formatting will carry over to the output file. So it lets you do basically like word processing to some degree inside of org mode. And let me actually pull up my notes here so that I remember what else I was gonna show. There it is. Yes, okay, so. Um, now, we, we, I mentioned that we could create headlines by putting stars at the beginning of the line, but uh, obviously that would be pretty tedious if you had to do that all the time. So there are uh, built-in key bindings that will help you to do this much more quickly. So if I were to go into this heading, let's say to the end of the heading, and hit uh, control enter or control return, you can see that it dropped me down to this next line with a star at it. So basically what that does is creates a new um, item at the same indentation level or the same star level uh, under the existing one. So we can say uh, inserted heading. But uh, if you want to insert something directly after this, like say for instance, you wanted to break up some sections that you had, you can hit alt enter instead. And then that will insert the, the new heading at the same level, but right after the heading, and it will basically insert it before the content that was under that heading. 
Um, so that can be helpful in certain cases. Um, also, that works for subheadings as well. So if I were to go to the end of the subheading and hit Control Enter, then it will add another heading below that at the same level. And then um, what you can also do is if you wanted to reorganize the content in your document, uh, you can easily uh, use the alt and arrow keys. So if I go to this inserted heading uh, header and I hit alt up, then it will move it above the heading at the same level, basically. Um, so with subheading here, I don't know if it will move it up above because you can't um, put it above the thing it was there before or the at the higher level. I think there's another key binding you can use. Maybe it's shift alt up. Yeah, then you can just basically move the whole thing. But, um, but that's pretty useful for whenever you're writing like a longer document and you want to reorganize sections um, or if you have like a to-do list and you want to move items around, you can use alt, use alt up and down for that purpose. So then um, the next thing would be um, once we've, you know, we've seen link uh, the formatting stuff. So um, what we could do next is try to add links. So if you wanted to insert a link in your document so you could cause it to navigate to an external page, um, you could do something like this. So we'll say like here is the org mode homepage and you can select the text. And then uh, you, if you use the org insert link command, which is uh, bound by default to control C, control L in org mode buffers, uh, it will ask you at the bottom what the link is. And uh, since I'm gonna go to the org mode homepage, I'll say HTTPS colon colon org mode.org and press enter. And then it asks for a description. So if I had not selected this text already, then I could type in a description that will be put into the buffer. But in this case, I've already selected text and it has populated that already. So I just hit enter and then that will create the, the link. Let me turn on this volume a little bit on the, on the music. So uh, now that we have this link in the buffer, um, you can see that, you know, you can just basically put your cursor over it and nothing really happens. But uh, if you wanted to navigate to what link is there, you can use the, let's see, what, what did I say that it was? It was org open at point, org open at point. And that is bound by default to uh, control C, control O. So if you uh, hit that uh, command, it will open up. Uh, let's see, I think that it must have caused an issue somewhere, but let me try that one more time. EXWM switched to buffer. Yeah, I think the EXWM is doing something weird at the moment, but suffice it to say that is what would happen in that case. All right, let's get rid of these windows because they're going to cause us trouble. And then EXWM. Sorry, folks, sometimes EXWM likes to give me trouble while, while I'm streaming, which is a, a nice thing to have happen. All right, here we go. We're back to the Emacs now. Okay, so uh, that was uh, following links, which is nice. Um, so now uh, what another thing you can do in org mode is uh, you can uh, in, insert tables. So if you wanted to um, keep some information, like if you're taking measurements of something or you wanted to have like a table of um, you know, things that were done or things you wanted to investigate, you can easily create a table by just starting to add a heading. So let's say maybe name, uh, age, and uh, uses Emacs. And if I were to go down to the next level and then type in uh, David, and then uh, I'll put uh, age, and then if I hit space, uh, or sorry, uh, tab, it will automatically like reformat this table and then uh, if I were to add another line, I believe you can press, maybe it's like shift enter or alt enter. Uh, there's, there's a key you can press to add a new row by, uh, automatically. But if I were to type like something longer, like let's say Alexander and then, uh, press tab, then it will reformat the whole table to fit whatever text or whatever content is in there, which is really helpful if you, uh, don't want to be going and trying to line up all of these pipe characters, uh, for the columns all the time. So that can be pretty useful to. Um, to maintain a table. I think also if you have a uh, like a header line here, it will also fix it or it will cause it to be updated across the, t the headers, but it's not working for me right now. I don't really use tables very much. So if, uh, if it seems like I don't know what I'm talking about, then that's why. So uh, also um, there's another thing you can do for um, setting up um, 
uh, bulleted list. So like if you wanted to have like a checklist of things to do or just like a list of things that you're, you know, like a list of links that you wanted to navigate to, you can have like a simple list. So first item, you can hit alt enter like you do with the, the headings and also create sub items. So second item, third item. So that's just alt enter basically to, to insert those. So um, now if you were to do the cycling of the view, you'll see that those items don't show up because they're treated as content and not as headers. So it's like a second way of doing um, lists of things if you wanted to. I believe it also works with numbers. So if you were to say one, uh, one and hit enter. Oh, no, it didn't work like that. Well, I believe that uh, if you have it somewhere where it doesn't get confused about what your intentions are, then it will do the automatic numbering for you like now. So. I think because I had it after another list, it just switched them all over to um, to unnumbered items. But now that I put it by itself, it does, does numbered items. OK, so another thing you can do with uh, these bulleted lists is to turn them into checklists. So if you just basically put this syntax of a, an open and closed square bracket with a space in between, it turns into a checklist. And you can tell that by looking at the colorization that Emacs is doing to this item. Um, if you want to uh, check this item, obviously you, you can just put a capital X in here, but um, uh, we're in Emacs, we should have key bindings to do things. So if I were to figure out how to delete that character, then um, I can run the org toggle checkbox command. And uh, that's bound to control C, control X, control B, which sounds like a lot, but it's pretty easy to hit. Actually, I'll show you. Um, if I were to run that command, it will check this checkbox for me. So. Uh, if you want to hit that command easily, just keep holding down uh, caps, or sorry, holding down control, like uh, control C, X, B, and then it just uh, it does the, the checking, the toggling. I don't think it works. Uh, let's see. Uh, C, X, B. Yeah, it doesn't work if you haven't put the box there already, but I believe if you hit um, shift, alt, enter after an item like this, it will continue adding checkboxes as new items. So that's one way you can get around this. And in fact, I think if you to create an empty list and then hit shift alt enter it does create a checkbox for you so that's another way you can get to that a little bit more easily so i find these to be useful whenever i am writing notes for um a kind of like a higher level task that i'm working on and i want to have a checklist for things but i don't want them showing up as top level headings um like sort of like you know here's the things i need to do next and um it's easy to just mark those off there without having to to change uh, the to-do state of headings themselves so uh, next thing, source blocks. So one of the cool features I think about um, org mode is that you can have blocks of source code in your um, in your document, and you can do a lot of cool things with it. Um, I use that for setting up my org, my Emacs configuration and my actually my whole system configuration using org mode files with source blocks in them. But that's a much bigger topic that we'll cover on a separate stream um, in the near future. So uh, just the basic. Uh, formulation of this would be to um, type this uh, dollar or sorry like hash plus begin underscore source and then the name of the language that you want to use which generally corresponds to the mode that you um, that the code would be highlighted based on so if we want to do it for like let's say emacs lisp you could type emacs lisp and then we can uh, do end underscore source to close it and then inside this block, you can say uh, defund uh, my elisp funk. And then it indents for you. So message uh, hello. So now you can see that we have some embedded elisp, ELISP code, Emacs Lisp code in this buffer, which is pretty cool. So um, let's see, what else can we do? Um, yeah, so, so far, I mean, we've seen s sort of like a good smattering of like the functionality you can do at a basic basic level when editing org, org mode buffers but um one of the big things about org mode is to uh do like to do lists and stuff and this is the point where org mode becomes a lot more uh, rich in terms of functionality so um what you can do on any given heading is you can give it a to-do state and to do that you can um, go to the beginning of the heading and type in the word to do and as you notice, it, they started highlighting this in a different color, uh, indicating that it, it means something to org mode. So um, org mode comes by default with, I think, only two states. It's to do and done. And uh, 
as in general Emacs fashion, you can change that to have any other number of states you want, and you can get some pretty complex behavior as a result of this. But uh, we're going to cover that in the next stream, I think. We'll, we'll go into a whole sort of a discussion about org mode workflow and how you can customize everything uh, to that degree. Uh, so for here, if I wanted to change this to do to being done, um, you could say uh, org org to do, or you could run it or the org to do command and that's bound by default to control c control t so if i was to run that command you'll see that it got turned to done and the heading itself uh, had, now has this color sort of diminished so you can see that it's done um another way to do this which is a little bit more common is you hold shift and press an arrow key so if i hold shift and press right it takes the status away if you hold shift and press right again it changes it to, to do so basically you're like toggling the status through the possibilities if you had more tags for for tasks they would all go cycle through as you do control shift sorry shift left and shift right so you can basically just turn it back and forth however however you want so um control c control t or shift left shift right uh, those things will uh, toggle the status of your task so generally you would have a file that would have probably a list of these to do's and then under the to do you would have a lot of content basically describing you know like what you're doing for the to do. Um, there's some other metadata that can be attached to these headings um, under what they call a property drawer. Uh, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail next time whenever we talk about um, uh, sort of tracking tasks and whatnot. So let's see, what else was I gonna say on that front? I believe that was everything for the basics of org mode. Uh, if anybody here has any questions about org mode so far, please uh, put them in a chat uh, or leave them as a comment on the video if you're not watching the live stream, and then I'll be happy to answer them. So um, at this point, um, we have a good sort of general feel for what org mode can do as a just general document editor. But as you as you can see, you know we're looking at this text uh, using a fixed width font. We have all these sort of stars. If we were to put more headings under here. Um, Let's say if I wanted another heading, I could put I could put the same level heading and then hit tab and it shifts it over one. So if you start putting more and more headings at more and more levels, you'll see there's just like more stars. So, you know, this sort of starts looking a little bit noisy after a while and you start thinking, well, how can I make this look better? Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to um, clean up this UI a little bit so that it looks more appealing. And uh, there is um, some built in configurations you can set, plus some external packages you, could, you can use for that. So first of all, um, I am going to grab some of this stuff that I already have here, and I'll explain what all of this does. So let's jump back over to our init.el file, and I will replace this use package org with the, um, the, the stuff that I just added. So um, we're adding now a configuration section to our use package, and we're also adding a hook that calls a function, and I will change this to EFS from Emacs for, from scratch, just because uh, the other is my initials and we don't really want that there. So um, what, the reason why we need this hook instead of putting everything in config is because every time an, e, an org mode buffer starts up, we want to run these commands to, to set various things to happen inside of the buffer. So I'm gonna take off, um, let's see, dent mode. Yeah, let's, let's take off everything. Well, in fact, let's just leave it off for now and see if uh, we notice anything that we want to fix. And uh, I don't have commenting hooked up yet, so I'll have to do that manually. So um, so the first thing we want to do is we want to look at our file one more time. And I'll show you that when we collapse all the headings, you'll see that there are these ellipses at the end of each line. And um, it, you know it's fine at first, but you start to, start to notice that it looks a little bit distracting whenever you have like uh, other punctuation and dot, dot, dot. So uh, you can change that, actually. We're going to go back to the init.el and we are going to use the org ellipsis var variable to set a different character for that purpose. And if you use uh, describe variable control HV to look for that, uh, basically just says the ellipsis to use in the org mode outline. When nil, just use a standard three dots. Uh, when a non empty string, use that string instead. So this is purely a uh, cosmetic change. Um, let's see, hide emphasis markers. Uh, I think I. Yeah, we'll talk about that, but we won't, we won't do it yet. So I'm just going to quickly run that to set that value. And now we're going to go back to the org mode buffer. And we're going to run org mode, the command, just to sort of restart that mode. 
And now if I were to uh, cycle the headings again, you can see that we have the nice little drop down character at the end and not the dot 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 anymore. So uh, I find this to be a little bit more aesthetically pleasing in the sense that it's not um, a dot 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 at the end of the line. Uh, it looks more like what you would see if you were like, you know, expanding a, a heading in some other type of application. So uh, that is pretty nice. And uh, let's jump back over to the config. So um, there's also this org hide emphasis markers, and this one is kind of debatable, and I'll show you why. So whenever we were looking at our um, uh, markup here where we said that uh, here is some content and we bolded the word some, uh, we had to write these stars around it to get it to do the bolding. Well, you can make those go away if you think it's noisy, and you can use this uh, org hide emphasis markers variable to do that. And if we were to look at that variable, it tells us that um, it means font lock should hide the emphasis marker characters, which basically means any any formatting characters that wrap something to to change the formatting. So I'm going to run this now, and I'll go back to that buffer. And then um, if I were to run org mode again, you can see now that the text is still bolded, but we don't see the stars that are around it. So this is nice because it re reduces noise, but it's sort of not nice because uh, now you don't see these stars around. And if you were to go to the end of this word and hit backspace, well, if you were to go to um, the another sort of edge of the word and hit backspace, eventually you're gonna hit the, pl the place where the star is. It's just not visible. So you can, you can delete the star, you can make it not bold anymore, but um, it, you might not remember that it's there and it will you know, sort of end up with some weird editing situations sometimes, just like that that I just did. So I hit space and it made the, the asterisk move over and even though I forgot it was there. Similarly with uh, with italics, there's a syntax for doing italic characters, which is uh, two slashes. I think you would call those forward slash, backslash. I don't know. If somebody knows, let me know in the chat. And if I'd say italic, it's supposed to make the text italic, but because this font doesn't do italic characters, then it just looks like normal text. And since you can't see those uh, formatting characters around it, you don't know that it's italic at all until you try to start deleting it. And then you see, oh, there's, there's formatting stuff here. So... I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of torn on it. In my personal configuration, I have that uh, turn, the setting turned on, but it does cause some confusion sometimes. So just be aware of that. Um, the same thing happens with links, even though the setting is irrelevant to links. If you hit backspace here, then you'll see the actual syntax for an org link pop up, which is good to know. It's good to know that there's a syntax here that you can use. But, um, you know, sometimes when you're editing a file that has links in it, then you'll end up seeing this. So the way to fix this is just to put the square bracket back at the end and then uh, the text gets formatted correctly again. So that is the um, uh, the hide emphasis marker setting. And I'll go back and just take that back out. Okay, so um, another thing that we talked about is the stars at the beginning of the lines. Yes, thanks Chuck, it's forward slash the, uh, the name for that character that we were using. So um, the bullets at the end of the lines or the beginnings of the lines can be uh, converted into something more appealing by using the org bullets package. So let me go and grab my configuration for that. So org bullets basically just lets you say for the various levels of indentation and for the headings, um, let's use different characters for to display those instead of the stars that were being used before. So we're gonna use this org bullets package and uh, we're gonna customize the org bullets uh, bullet list. In fact, how about we just look at what it looks like to, by default and then you'll see why I want to customize it. So uh, we're gonna run this little part first and it's gonna install it from Melpa. Um, I don't know why it has this ugly output in the mini buffer when you install it, but that's what happens. So if you see that, don't, don't be alarmed. Uh, I'm gonna jump back over to hello.org and um, since we were already here, the hook doesn't work because we, were, we, we the buffer's already open, but we can run the org bullets uh, mode command in using uh, meta X. And then you'll see that the bullet characters have now changed. So the first level heading and second level heading characters are kind of nice, but then we start getting into like stars and flowers and weird stuff like that. So um, for me, I prefer to just keep like this, the whole circle motif going. So I will go back and uh, customize the bullets list. And then I'll go back over to hello.org. And then if I were to cycle the use of org bullets mode, now you can see that we have circles at each level. And if I were to uh, collapse that a little bit, it's easier to see. In fact, let me see if I can increase the text again, uh, text scale. 
amount. Whoops, that's the wrong. Text scale uh, adjust. Oh, okay, so now you can see that we have these circles at the beginning of the lines. Now the thing to note about this is that it didn't just take away those stars that were there. They're actually still there. Uh, if you put your cursor over at the beginning of this, you'll see that the stars are still visible whenever you have them highlighted. And this is because uh, org uh, bullets will take the characters that were there before and manipulate them so that the first couple characters use the same color as the background that you use in your uh, in your Emacs theme, uh, and then replaces the last character with the one that you specified. So. Uh, in my opinion, this looks a lot better than what we had before because at least the um, you don't see all that noise at the beginning of the line. So I think less noise is better for you to be able to focus in on what actually matters in the document that you're editing. So uh, let's see. We'll go back. Um, so one other thing that I like to do in my orgma buffers is um, I, I like to be able to distinguish even more between the different headings that I have in the file. And one way that I do that is by scaling the size of the text that I use for uh, each uh, heading level. So we can easily do that with some built in functions for Emacs. Um, if I were to go down here and grab this, I'll explain what it all does. So um, we're basically going to do a do list over the uh, a set of faces. So each of these faces is something that's defined by uh, org mode. And as we've talked about before, a face is basically like how you define the formatting for a particular set of text on the screen in Emacs. So um, the, all these different levels are numbered here and I've got, um, I've paired them with the sort of scale of the text that I wanna use for each level. And I run this through the do list function at which for each of these items, it will call set face attribute and um, it does two things. One is it sets it to a font that's not fixed width. It's going to be using a, uh, a variable width font to make it look a little bit more like a document. And then we're going to change the scale of the text at the same time. So if I go run this whole block, then we can go back to our uh, Emacs, or sorry, our org mode buffer. And now you can see that the text has more of a document look to it. It has a variable width font. And then the in, the contents inside of that still does have the uh, the fixed width font that we used before the Fira code. So um, uh, this is sort of another thing that's debatable. Like some people may just want to have monospace font uh, the whole time, but uh, for me, um, if you look at my uh, Emacs configuration file or even this file, you can see that it looks kind of nice to have you know text that is uh, variable width whenever it's supposed to be a document, and then have fixed width whenever you're looking at code or or symbols and stuff like that. So. It's really just a matter of taste, but this is how I like to do it. So um, what else can we do? So we showed those um, bulleted lists before. If we go back, we can see the bulleted list we added. I guess we only have that one item there, right? So let's just add a couple more items here. Uh, test, test two. So um, what we can do is if we don't like these hyphens, we can actually change that to a different character. So if I go back to our configuration file, I can drop in this little bit of code. And uh, this looks a little bit more arcane than what we've done before. Uh, basically what it says is um, for Emacs um, font colorization, uh, we can say that in org mode, for any org mode buffer, we can use a regular expression to say, if you see any line that starts with um, a hyphen, you can change it uh, to have a dot. Now, I did not come up with this little snippet myself. I actually got it from a blog post that I found somewhere. Um, so I can't say that I'm an expert in doing this, but you know this works for me. So let's just run this little snippet of code and make sure that it's gonna be balanced correctly. Okay, cool. And if I jump back over to the org mode buffer, uh, and let's say if I, maybe I needed to restart it. Okay, yeah, so I ran org mode again, and now you can see that the hyphens have now turned into dots. So that's another way you can kind of improve the look of it a little bit if you wanted to do, the, do it that way. Uh, you, maybe you want to keep it as hyphens. I don't know. It's really uh, really up to you. And let's see. What else have we got here? So we can also make it so that the body text is uh, a uh, variable width. Uh, let's see about how I did that. So I'm gonna have to go to my own Emacs config because I did not copy this part over. And let's see if I can pull that up. It's, I'm having a little bit of slowness this morning. Okay, so a uh, set face attribute. So um, what you'll see here is that in Emacs, you can say that uh, 
for a particular type of face, uh, you can have a particular type of font. So for fixed pitch fonts, which would be any type of thing that's supposed to be monospaced, you can say what font and what font size to use for that. You can also do the same thing for variable pitch fonts, which are the, uh, the sort of do more document looking fonts. So I'll copy this text over to the, um, our, our configuration file that we're working on. And I'll add it back up to the point where we're talking about face attributes here. So um, like I mentioned, we're setting face attributes for types of text. So the, we're setting the default basically to uh, Fura code retina, but we're gonna set the fixed pitch default to Fura code. And we're gonna set the variable pitch, pitch default to Cantarell with these various font sizes. So uh, if I go back to the org mode buffer, you'll see that nothing's really changed yet. But if we were to run the command uh, variable pitch mode, then all of the content here gets changed to a variable pitch font. And it also follows the, uh, the setting, the font setting that we use for the variable pitch mode. So um, now you notice that uh, both tables and uh, the ELIS block that we have, they don't have uh, the right sort of formatting anymore because they are using a variable fit pitch font. So the way that you can fix that is to go back over to the config and I'm gonna grab some stuff that I have saved up for that purpose. Let's see, uh, Cantarel. Cantarel, okay, I don't see it here. Oh no, it was there, Cantarel, Cant. Right there, okay. So I have this whole little set of things that I use in my configuration to um, to configure which things are shown as uh, fixed pitch in a document that would normally be variable pitch. Because when you turn on variable pitch mode, it basically turns the entire document to variable pitch. But you can also set face attributes for individual types of faces in the org mode document to say, I want that to be fixed pitch instead. So it overrides what the, the buffer setting is for that. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and eval this region. Invalid face org indent. Let's. Oh, okay. I know. I know why that's happening. I'll uh, exclude that one for now. So let's uh, eval region on that. And now, if I were to go back to that buffer, uh, you can see now that the uh, elisp code is now back to being a uh, fixed pitch font. Uh, the table is not, but I think that's because I need to go and set the uh, the org table. Because, like I mentioned before, I don't really use org table, so I think that we have to. Um, search for that one. So I'm going to run uh, describe face. And uh, this is really helpful because if there's other things that you find in your document that you want to fix this for, if you go to describe face and then you type org dash and hit tab, then you'll see all of these uh, faces that explain like what um, different things in the document might, might be highlighted as. And I see here there's org table. So if I were to put org table here and run that also, then go back over to the hello.org, then my table now has a fixed pitch font. So that kind of gives you the ability to have um, document looking fonts whenever it's normal text and also have fixed pitch fonts whenever it uh, it's necessary for things to be lined up in a certain way. Um, so I find that to be pretty useful. Uh, the reason why I use variable pitch fonts in org mode buffers is because I do a lot of writing in org mode. Um, I will do both journaling and uh, writing like plans and designs and um, I, you know, it's nice to have the uh, fix with fonts sometimes, but I just kind of like the way that the variable pitch looks, um, uh, is sort of appeals to me more. So if that's something that also appeals to you, then, then that's what you can do. So uh, another thing that I'd like to do inside of my org mode buffers is, is to turn it into um, visual line mode with um, more sort of padding on the sides because uh, if I'm writing a document, I don't really want to be looking over to the very leftmost side of the buffer all day long because it just kind of just doesn't feel right, I guess, aesthetically to me. So there's a way that you can fix that. And uh, I'll let you know in advance. I haven't actually practiced this part, so it might be a little bit rough. So um, we're going to see this happen in real time. So if I say, I don't even remember what's called, to be honest with you. Visual fill, fill mode is the package that I use for that. Okay. If I can get back to it. Visual fill mode. And apparently I have lost the ability to type this morning. Please feel free to ask questions at any time. Also, if you, uh, if you, if you think of anything that you want to know about. So we're right here, visual film mode. 
And I think, let's see, org mode visual fill. Yeah, I'm using a hook for this because I want to configure the um, the width of the buffer. So if I jump back over to my init.yell and oops, and I drop this configuration in. So let's turn this to Emacs from scratch and this to Emacs from scratch. And I will, um, I'll explain what all this does in just a second. So um, what we're doing, oh, this is gonna install visual fill mode real quick. Uh, visual fill mode is unavailable, really? Oh, that may be in Elpa, let's see. Sometimes you have to look and find out where a package comes from. So uh, Emacs visual fill mode. We'll uh, figure out what to do about this. Okay, so it looks like it's in Elpa and it's called visual fill. So um, that might be something that you need to be aware of. I will try to run this one more time and it seems to have worked. So um, what we're doing is we, every time we run an org mode buffer, we're gonna turn on this visual fill mode and we're gonna say we want the, the width of the screen to be 100. And I think that's based on character width. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but that's what's been working for me so far. And we also say we want to center the text on the screen. So then we turn on the visual fill column mode at that point. So if I jump back over to our hello.org buffer, um, let's actually kill it first and um, start it up again so that we see it actually happen. So if I were to say control X, control F to edit the file, hello.org, and uh, I think we just got a message because apparently it didn't work. Um, it was in messages buffer, file mode specification error, void function, visual fill column mode. Now that's interesting. Let's look for that because I may have pulled the wrong package for that. Okay, visual fill column. And is this on Melpa? Visual fill column, okay. That's my mistake, I apologize for that. Like I said, I hadn't practiced that part, so it was bound to go wrong. So I think it's visual fill column that we want to do. So let's run that one more time. And then let's go back to our hello org buffer. Let's kill this buffer. And then let's type hello.org again. Now we can see that the buffer has some padding over on the left side, and uh, it also has some padding on the right side as well. So now we have a more sort of document editing experience at this point. If we were to take this uh, uh, text and continue to paste it into the buffer, uh, one thing we do see here is that it um, it's not wrapping. So we want that to be able to wrap. And to do that, you can turn on visual line mode, which will cause the, the buffer text to wrap. So what we'll need to do is go back to our init.el and then add that to our hook that we use to whenever org mode starts up. So let me... Why is this not working? Okay. So we have org mode set up. Uh, we need to turn on variable pitch mode. Okay, so yeah, we, we took the hook out. Let's add this hook back in now. We can explain what it does. So now for any org mode buffer, we're, we're gonna run this command that uh, turns on org indent mode, uh, variable pitch mode, auto fill mode. Now let me look that one up because I don't actually remember. Automatic line breaking. Um, when auto fill mode is enabled, insert a space or column beyond automatically breaks the line at a previous space. That one I'm not so sure about if it needs to be there or not. Let's actually take that out. I had it in my config. I'm not sure if it's actually needed. And then we want to turn on a uh, visual line mode. And uh, I'm also turning off evil auto indent because I think it was giving me trouble at some point, but I don't remember why, to be honest. But uh, let's take that out too. So um, we've got our hook function. And now we're going to register the hook. And if we go back to hello.org and kill its buffer, reopen it. I know I'm probably not doing this the most efficient way. Now you can see by default, whenever you open the buffer, it is wrapping the lines at the end of the visual column space. So um, now basically we can edit this like it's as if it's like, uh, well, let's not invoke the name, but uh, Microsoft Word document. So um, you can easily uh, edit text to your heart's content. If you think that the text looks too small, you can tweak all the font settings that we were talking about before and make it a little bit bigger. This looks a little bit small for my taste on the screen, but I think it's probably fine in general. But uh, yeah, I mean, like we basically went from a basic org mode configuration to having something that looks a lot more um, friendly in general. And, uh, you know, ha give some more flexibility for different types of content editing. So. I think that uh, is uh, probably where we'll stop for today. Uh, 
Can people still see my video? Because I feel like my video is frozen here. Wow, if the video froze, that would be really amazing. Anyway, um, so next time what we're going to talk about is um, setting up org mode to use it for uh, task management and uh, project management. Yeah, okay. Knack, thanks for letting me know that it's frozen. I don't know what's going on with that. Let me turn my camera off and back on. This is probably going to be a nightmare. Okay. Well, we'll we'll just uh, disable it for now, I think, or we'll just we'll forget about it. I enjoy seeing my face frozen at the bottom right corner of the screen. That's a really nice thing to have happen. So, uh, like I was saying, we'll, we're we're going to cover org mode and how to use it for project management. We're going to look at how the agenda works and how to configure uh, org mode for different types of tasks, etc. So I think that's going to be pretty fun the next time. Um, so. Um, if you uh, are interested in watching the next video and you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please definitely uh, hit the subscribe button below the video and uh, hit the bell also, because if you don't hit the bell, you may not get the notification. YouTube likes to just not notify people whenever they subscribe to a channel. So make sure to, to hit the bell. And also, uh, last time after I did the last stream, um, someone in the chat, a very nice person asked how they could uh, uh, support the channel financially. So uh, I decided to set up a GitHub sponsors for this. And uh, a couple I'm going to go to the next one.